Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Isakaya Savage, and I am honored to be your host for the evening. Welcome to Unplugged young black artists speaking out. The Coalition for African Americans in the Performing Arts, also known as CAPA, have an exciting and informative panel discussion planned for you. I'm thrilled about this event and the panelists that are chosen to participate, as CAPA is one of the few organizations providing a platform specifically for young artists of this generation to allow them to let their voices be heard amidst the great challenges in our world. COVID-19, civil unrest due to police brutality, inequity in the classical world of arts, and probably much more. We will come to understand not only how the panelists feel about these current events, but also how they are finding ways to cope and develop inspiration in the face of it all. I'm very excited to hear from these young artists, but first, I would like to introduce Kappa's co-founder and chairperson, Ms. Pamela Simonson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being here with us this evening. I am so excited as my brother Victor and I and, um, and I started Kappa many years ago to give back to the community. And our community is vibrant, it's talented, it's fierce. And so we are so grateful to have a panel of talented, fierce, and vibrant artists that I look forward to hearing from this evening. And I know we not only are we going to learn from them, but we want to know as Kappa how we can help you. So think, please stay in touch with us. Thank you for being here again. And I am so ready to hear what this next hour brings. Next up, you will hear my mother and the executive director for Kappa, Terry Allen. Good evening and welcome to Unplugged. I'm so grateful that you're here tonight with the Coalition for African Americans in the Performing Arts. We have a panel of wonderful, wonderful young people. But before we get started, I'd just like to let you know that CAFA is an arts organization, nonprofit that helps bring color to the classics. And we do that by supporting black classical musicians and others in the performing arts. We are so grateful for these young people tonight because we want to hear their voices. I want you to continue to support Kappa as you have been doing in the past. We're so grateful for your kind consideration. And if you feel so inclined, please help support the music scholarship program. You'll see something on your screen later on uh, after the panel. And if you would like to make a contribution to the coalition to help Black classical musicians, it would be greatly, greatly appreciated. We want to thank all of our volunteers and all of the uh, participants tonight for just being here and being a part of this wonderful panel discussion. And now, without further ado, we have a wonderful, wonderful moderator. I met her just a few years ago. She began with Kappa as an intern. She just graduated and moved on up. She is now an arts administrator doing a very fine job with a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. Please, I'd like to welcome and please join me in welcoming Christina Lyles.
uh, solidified three uh, recital or actually two recitals with one particular um, organization in Philadelphia and I think two or three recitals with Kappa, but they all got canceled um, due to COVID. Um, and then I was also working as a, as a teacher, I, I still am, so um, I was working from home. And um, as far as my performance career is concerned, there have been a lot of things put on hold, mainly because most performance halls, most venues are, are closed. So I'm not really able to um, like fully advocate for myself as, a, as an artist. But the silver lining in the pandemic is I've had a lot of time to really think about the kind of artist that I want to be. I've had a lot of time to prepare and really strategize for the future and really rethink how I'd like to present myself as an artist and um, what I want my career to look like going forward. So it's it's definitely been a challenge you know um artistically and financially but at the same time i'm grateful for the time that kappa has presented you know all of us yes i completely understand um it's so unfortunate that so many of us had so many wonderful opportunities mm -hmm. this year that have now had to just kind of go on the back burner but like you said this has been a wonderful time to do some self-reflection and reconfiguring some things. So I'm happy to hear that you you found that bit of hope um, through it all. Thank you for that. Um, so Jemiah, would you like to share how you have been artistically impacted during this time of COVID? Um, honestly, I feel like during COVID, opportunity definitely happened more in the face of adversity. Um, I can honestly say I've done more songwriting and I've done a lot more things with music during COVID than I have when COVID wasn't here, if that makes sense. Um, you know, people beg to differ and there are pros and cons to it because of, you know, social, social distancing and having to be home. Uh, quarantine was a little bit difficult at the time, but it did not stop me from submitting writing and, um, and songs to artists who were in need of them. So I can honestly say that it hasn't really been halted. It just got a little bit more enhanced. Thank you. I really appreciate your response. Um, I'm really happy that a lot of opportunities have actually come out of this time. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I just wanna pause right here. Um, I know that we've had some technical challenges. I just heard that the video was not recording all of this time. So what I would like to do, if at all possible, is just to call you all's names and just if you can just share a little bit about yourself again so now our viewers can um, catch this information before we continue to delve into the conversation. Um, that would be very helpful. I apologize um, to the viewers and to you all for this inconvenience. Um, and I'll just go ahead and start with Dean. If you could just share something about yourself. Hello, everybody. My name is Dean Johnson. I am a musician. I My concentration is piano. I am classically trained, but I am, but my focus all these years has been gospel, pop, and R&B. And also, I am an actor. Thank you so much, Dean, for that. Um, now, if Ayana can introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ayana Freelon. I am originally from Grenada, Mississippi. I'm, I'm currently uh, based in Baltimore, Maryland, and I, I moved here from Texas. I um, lived in Texas for 10 years, and I pursued um, my bachelor's degree um, from Texas Southern University. I have a bachelor's of arts in music with a minor in theater. And then I moved to Baltimore to pursue my master's um, of art and music from Morgan State University. I am a classically trained soprano, so um, I specialize in opera music or opera. And I'm also an educator and faculty member at Baltimore School for the Arts. Thank you so much, Diana. Now, Jemiah, would you please reintroduce yourself? 
Hi everyone, my name is Jemiah Nash. I'm 24 years old. I'm a singer, songwriter, and actress. Um, I started all of this when I was five and I'm continuing to do so. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thank you, Jemiah. And then we'll have Kai. Could you please share a bit about yourself? Hello everyone, my name is Kylan Adams. I'm a writer, educator, arts administrator, born and raised in Washington, DC. I attended Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Then I got my bachelor's of arts degree from George Mason University. And then I currently work um, with Kappa, but in addition to Kappa, I also work for Disney Theatrical Group in New York City. Thank you so much, Kylan. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, and lastly, before I introduce our last panelist, I would just like to share with the viewers that Aaron um, is coming to this panel from a business lens, and that's what he will be sharing um, his perspectives and experiences on this evening during the panel. So Aaron, would you please share a bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Richards. I'm 24 years old. Uh, I received my MBA and bachelor's from St. John's University in uh, finance and econ, respectively. Um, currently, I work at the Department of Transportation as a compliance officer. Um, Air Force Reserve officer in the logistics field, and I run an online investment uh, company. Thank you so much, Aaron. And just to our viewers out there, I know you all missed our initial introduction. I will say my name is Christina Lyles, and I am your moderator for this evening. Um, tonight's conversation is just a time to reflect on this difficult and challenging year. By the end of the panel, you will hear how each panelist has um, pers persevered and has been resilient through this difficulty and challenging time. Um, and so that's what we've shared. I have already asked each of the panelists to share how they have had to shift their artistic endeavors um, during this challenging year. And we left off with Kylan and I'll leave that um, now to you to share. Yes, so prior to the pandemic happening, I was working in New York City um, as the education and audience engagement coordinator. So working with audiences, working with talkbacks, working with students and really engaging them on our three Broadway shows at the time. Um, and then the pandemic happened and I was working from home for a month and then I got furloughed. Um, and then a couple of months later, I came back to DC. But for me, in all honesty, it's been such a moment to really focus in on what my artistic craft is. Because prior to that, I was just working anywhere from like 40 to 60 hours a week, just like trying to pay the bills, trying to pay these student loans. And so really coming back home to really rethink like why am I interested in art anyway has been great for me. I've been able to um, team up with some old uh, classmates and begin doing webinars and really begin uh, focus in on my art, creating a blog. And so for me, it's been an enlightening experience for me to really ask myself the question, like, what do I want the future of my life to be artistically? And how do I make sure that I am always tapping into that and keeping it close with me? So having this moment to really redefine where I want to go has been really, really um, great for me. Thank you so much, Kylan. I really, really appreciate your response. And so the next question that I would like to ask is, can you share how you best adapted and shifted your artistry and your artistic endeavors during this challenging year? Would anyone like to answer that? Sure. So um, since I've been doing a lot of work from home, uh, most of my audition material, obviously, you know, I've had to, you know, record from my house. I've had to learn how to work with pre-recorded tracks. Um, but aside from the whole audition circuit, I've actually been uh, teaching myself how to use the Adobe Creative Cloud. And that's really important as an independent artist because oftentimes we don't have management. We don't have marketing teams. So, um, it's really important for us to be able to know how to present ourselves um, until we get to the point where, you know, we have management and we have a marketing team. But I've like, you know, taught myself how to create websites. I do flyers now um, for myself for the recitals that um, I've done just recently. I've, I've been able to um, curate a recital with Kappa um, and I, created the entire recital um, and the flyer. And uh, yeah, that's that's really how I've been able to kind of capitalize off of this time and stretch my other creative muscles. 
Well, that's amazing. I'm so happy that you have um, picked up some new skills. Like you said, yeah. health management is so important, um, especially now during this time um, to be able to have the skills to, like you said, create a flyer and curate a concert series is just excellent. So kudos to you. And thank you for sharing that, Ayana. Would anyone else like to share how they have to, had to shift and adapt? I'll say something. Um, so I realized I had a lot more time on my schedule to take classes, to really just build on the skills that I already had. And so what I did was, um, I went a certain, di I went a certain direction as far as taking classes with casting directors, because in my mind, I'm saying to myself, if I do that, these guys know me so by the time we get out of this pandemic it'll be easier for me to get in that room with them um so i've taken classes i've basically restructured my my brand i've had a a lot more time to really understand who i am as a person and to and to really hone hone my skills and just know what my brand really is and so um i that's what I did was just take more classes and got new headshots. So I will be set. So when the pandemic is finally over, Lord Jesus Christ, everything will be fine. Thank you so much, Dean. I'm so glad to hear that you've been able to pick up some classes and also learn some new skills and even update your headshots. That is so important nowadays that to always have that readily accessible. So great. Um, would anyone else like to to speak on this question? Yeah, I, I'd like to speak on it. Um, so prior to the pandemic, um, I had always had this idea to start this investment company, but being, I guess, all, always moving, I was going to originally have it with just people I knew. So it was going to really limit me to around, you know, 10, 20 people and then grow from there. Whereas me being at home, having more free time in my hands, I was able to research and find a platform that was open online. And just as I've had more time on my hands, people have as well. So um, I, I started the business on November 2nd. And since, as of yesterday, we have uh, 3,200 members. So it's actually helped a lot being online. Um, and they're also 50% uh, are in the US, 50% are outside the US. So just being in this, in this COVID era from a business standpoint um, has opened up tremendously. Wow, that's amazing. I'm really happy to hear that you've been able to get your business up and running and to have so many members in such a short amount of time is just amazing. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Maya or Kylan, would you like to add to this question as well? Um, I'll add um, how things have shifted for me. I would have to say that um, I have to really evaluate if it was something that I truly wanted to do and continue to do because it, it sounds crazy, but the arts is so up and down already. So to already have something challenging, something that's already a challenge is kind of crazy. So as I'm sitting home and I'm thinking about, is this something that I truly want to do? like this doesn't look like it's going to end like a lot of things go through your mind during that time um you know you settle into depression or you just question a lot of things in life and artistry is the last thing on your mind but one thing I will say is my artistry has pulled me out of that depression during that time so I will say being able to sit and really reevaluate things and see if it's something that I truly want to do it, it really did put things into perspective for me that's great. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, as you know, artistry is definitely a way to keep yourself grounded and to, you know, feed your soul. So I'm really happy to hear that. Thank you for sharing. Lastly, Kylan, would you like to add anything to this question? Yes, I think for me, I'm kind of going off of what some of the other panelists just spoke about. I think like the actual for me, having the mindset of actually understanding like what's going on, like we're in a pandemic, like live entertainment has to stop. We're now moving virtual, virtually was for me a mind shift and a mind shift because then my entire job had stopped. So now 
what I've been given literally 60 hours a week to is now gone. So how can I shift that? And something that I was missing was really engagement with my community, the community that I know. And so my friends and I, um, like speaking of mental health in um, April, we realized that a lot of mental health issues that we're not talking about specifically in the black community and specifically with artists. And so we started doing webinars and that just became something that we should just continue to do. We even did something for election night. Like what does the election night mean to us as black um, emerging professionals? And so we're beginning to have conversations of starting something we don't know quite sure, we're not quite sure what it's gonna be, but starting something as to give back to the community with a specific focus on those who are black emerging artists in high school and undergraduate, I mean, uh, undergrad who are coming up and we're like, what does it mean to be in the art? And then also, what does it mean to come from a certain marginalized community in the arts? And what's some, what is some extra support that you may have? Um, so that's been like the biggest thing for me. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to hear that you've been able to collaborate and work with other artists to um, leverage your artistry and also address some of the concerns in our communities as you shared. So that's wonderful to hear. And that actually perfectly leads me to uh, my next question, which is, how have you been able to perform and or collaborate with other emerging artists during this time of uncertainty? So um, for a little while, you know, uh, we, we weren't really sure what, it, I guess, what performance was gonna look like um, until I guess the entire classical uh, community got on the bandwagon of using like Zoom and and like you know you know recording and editing and stuff like that. But um, I have been uh, blessed with the opportunity to um, most recently. I think we uh, the the recital aired in November, but I was blessed with the opportunity to uh, perform in a recital where I had started planning this recital a year ago. You know, and it was supposed to um, it was supposed to be performed in early February or March, but of course the pandemic happened. But um, this recital was a joint recital with one of my colleagues from Morgan State University. She's a pianist, and it was to pay homage to Black women composers. And um, although we weren't able to do the recital in March, it really uh, was kind of a a silver lining that we that we did the recital in October and it aired virtually no um, October November first because we were able to partner with um, the Howard County Historical Society and um, do a segment that also paid homage to women's suffrage. So that was a really um, that was a really great opportunity that we both had, and I've also done uh, recitals with some of my other classmates from Morgan. Um, with uh, the Walters Art Museum, but all of these recitals have been virtual. It's been really interesting to work virtually and learn the ins and outs of what it takes to be a classical singer in front of a camera. But there, are, I think there are more things that I have to think about acoustically when it comes to you know recording myself and 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 being in front of the camera. So those are some of the things that I've done as a performer recently yeah thank you so much for sharing that i think that's so refreshing to hear that you've been able to shift uh, what what was before into something different um i know virtual learning virtual performing has been such a curve for us all um i'm sure at this point most of us are almost experts um with zoom and so many other digital platforms that we have to use almost every day now so I'm just so happy to hear that, again, you found that silver lining and shifted it. So thank you um, for sharing that. Would anyone else like to share how they've been able to virtually collaborate and work with other emerging artists during this time? I'll speak. Um, honestly, with um, other artists, what we, uh, piggybacking off what um, Ayana said, a lot of it has to do with like Zoom. Zoom has really helped bring people together. Um, I'm very thankful for Zoom because I've conducted stream meetings and recording sessions that we should have been at physically um, through Zoom. So I will say that, you know, I've done songwriting classes um, with others, uh, young kids, vocal lessons, all of that with um, 
you know, young adults to little kids and it hasn't stopped anything. And honestly, Zoom has kind of saved, you know, the little things on the side. If I'm not recording something, I'm usually able to do mentoring and teach people through this. So I will say that's the best thing that has ever happened to us with Zoom. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much. I definitely can agree with that. Um, even as we're doing this panel now virtually through Zoom, it's definitely been a lifesaver in so many different ways. So I completely agree with that. Um, would anyone else like to share how they've been working with other artists and collaborating? Um, I'll say something. Okay. Um, just like everyone has just been saying this now, um, Zoom. Zoom has been our best friend. If it, if it isn't Zoom, it's um it's uh, it's FaceTime. But I've been able to work with other artists uh, musically through Zoom, get their ideas, throw ideas back and forth, and then we just record on our own, and then we just send them through an email, and then we come right back on Zoom and have that meeting. So that's been you know. Like this video chatting has been the best um, tool for us during this whole time. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dean. I can't agree with you more on that. Um, Would anyone else like to share? Um, If not, I will move on to the last question of this first portion regarding um, COVID, which is how has this experience shaped your perspectives? and your future plans for next year? Um, I can speak to that. Um, Prior to, uh, as I said, the pandemic, kind of in this cycle of uh, working, going to the gym, coming home, getting ready for work. With this free time on my hands, I've been able to explore other avenues. And the goal now is to uh, bring in enough revenue to where I don't have to go back into the office. So uh, for next year, the plan is to um, work for myself and explore other avenues of revenue to where um, I go from working for somebody to working for myself. That's awesome. I love the sound of that. <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing that, Erin. I think that it's excellent that you have created this business that you've been wanting to do. And, and now you're looking forward to just taking on full entrepreneurship in a full-time role. So thank you for that. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this question? Can you repeat the question? (laughs) I'm sorry. So the question is, how has this experience shaped your perspective and future plans for next year? Okay. So um, this experience within the pandemic, um, spending so much time by myself alone, has really given me uh, the opportunity, as I stated earlier, to really reflect on the kind of artist that I want to present myself as um, for the future. And uh, my prayer is that all of this work that I've been doing, you know, preparing, I took a step back from the audition circuit. I mean, I did a couple of auditions, but I really wanted to take take this opportunity because it's a rare occasion that working artists have the time to even just like practice every day, schedule voice lessons, schedule coaching. It's a rare occasion that we have time to do all of that and work our full-time day jobs. I still, you know, have my obligations for the school that I work for. So my hopes is that all of this work that I've been doing, like woodshedding and uh, spending all this time by myself uh, preparing, I'm actually, you know, ready for some of the bigger opportunities that will present themselves once, you know, the performance world reopens. And I do believe that it will reopen because so many people are just like itching to get outside. You know, I even found myself reflecting a couple of times like, wow, I will not miss another opportunity to go to the Kennedy Center. Because so many times we're like, oh, I'll catch the next show. Oh, I'll catch the next show. But now having that medium completely taken away from us and all we have is the TV to see live performances, it's really been, you know, kind of depressing. 
So I know if I'm feeling this way, then the rest of America, the rest of the world is feeling the same way. So as soon as, you know, the vaccine or whatever, the pandemic, or we, we've learned to live with this new virus, people are going to be flocking to performance halls to hear live, you know, music and live, live art. And I want to be ready for that. And so I certainly hope that more artists are taking this time. I know we like feel very depressed and sad that our, our um, community of workers have just kind of been shut out. But at the same time, we have so much time to just find peace, you know, and really think about how we want to brand ourselves, what aspects of our personal lives do we want to take onto the stage with us? Like I'm very passionate about history. I'm very passionate about black composers. So I really hope to be working with um, young, new, vibrant composers, do some new music, new, you know, classical works. Hopefully there are some conductors out there who are just as passionate about black opera and want to put, you know, productions together. I would love to be a part of those conversations and those communities who are really looking to like, push, you know, Black composers and the classical music forward. Thank you so much um, for your response, Ayana. You raised so many great points. Um, and I just really appreciate your perspective on this question. Um, as you, one point, as you mentioned, that I think is very important is that, yes, we have all been itching to just get back out there and just jump right back into our many different endeavors and, you know, so many things that we were involved with. Right. Um, people will begin to turn back to the performing arts spaces um, once things get, like you said, recentered again and we're back on track. So I'm very hopeful about that. Um, and I hope people are also expecting that, you know, there is going to be a turning point and things will get better. So, so thank you for sharing that, um, Ayana. I want to just read the question one more time before I frame it to our last three panelists, which is how has this experience shaped your perspective and your future plans for next year? Dean, would you like to add to this question? Um, it's definitely, I, I, I guess I can say, you know, I, I feel like the things that I've, I've done during this pandemic between June and June between June and August that has set me up for the things for next year. I think I I, I went into this and I, I can you know congratulate I, I can even say thank you to one of my friends because he and I had the same idea to you know just prepare ourselves for when you know everything is over, everything will be set up. Our mindset back in June was, we're going to be out of this in September or October. Nah. So it's, it's um, just having done, done those things, I feel confident enough to, to, to know that everything will be okay. It just takes time. It just takes patience. Thank you. And that is definitely the truth. I'm really happy to hear also that you prepared yourself in a way that when things reopen, you'll be ready to just get back to it. So that's really hopeful. And I'm hoping that a lot of our artists have spent this time to reflect and just kind of get themselves together um, for that reopening. So thank you, Dean. Um, Jemiah, would you like to respond? Um, honestly, I have to say everybody kind of hit the nail on the head for me. Um, I agree with everyone. It is um, very, very not, I don't want to keep saying the word depressing, but it kind of is that <laughs> when you can't go to a live show and, you know, I was just watching, I believe it was the AMAs not too long ago. And I got really, really sad, like a time where it's supposed to be exciting. I got really sad because we saw no one in the audience. Everything was so like, rehearsal it, it looked like rehearsal and I just got really sad because I was like the excitement of seeing this stuff on tv is not there anymore because we know what it is now it's just another way to kind of cope with the fact that we can't physically be at these places so 
my biggest thing I will say for for next year is to just, you know, take those opportunities when, when things do open up. Cause I'm not going to say if I'm really hoping that, you know, it's <laughs> very different because 2020 has not been very nice. She's been very, um, very rude. So <laughs> I'm hoping 2021 is exactly what I think it will be. I am with you. I'm hoping that with you, <laughs> I'm hoping that 2021 will be a year of turnaround for us at some point. I know we'll still be working through some things, but I'm, I'm hopeful as well. So thank you. And lastly, Kylan, how about you? Would you like to add to this question as well? Yeah, I can add something. I think, again, just echoing the panelists, I think the biggest thing for me is never taking anything for granted. No opportunity, no artistic opportunity. Um, I, I also was someone that, that there would be a show and I'd be like, There's, I'll have time to see that show. I don't need to rush and go see it now. You know, like the meme says, outside isn't going anywhere and look at outside, it's gone. So I think for me, it's been like this thing of just trying to make sure that even in this moment, I'm taking advantage of every opportunity. But I think what, what gives me hope that the live entertainment field will come back um, and hopefully better than ever is like there have been so many innovative things that have came out of this like this has really forced a lot of companies a lot of networks to be more innovative in how they're producing shows and how we're reaching artists and how we're reaching um, consumers and audiences and audience members so my only hope is that we just continue with that as we move forward you know and and, and you know with the election, all the things that are happening well, with our new president-elect and all the things that are happening, you know, it's very hopeful that things are going to get back, not get back to normal, but they're going to be better than normal. And we're going to really be a part of br bridging the gap and building what that can be. So for me, it's just like really trying to remain hopeful that the that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely. And I think, like you said, it is so important that we just um, take advantage of each and every opportunity that is presented to us because in these days and in life, I think it's really showed us that you can't take things for granted and you have to go after it when it's presented to you and just not, um, you know, take it for granted. So I, I completely agree. Thank you so much. And so that wraps up the first portion of our panel. And so the second portion really focuses on social justice and it also delves a little into politics and the arts. Um, that being said, I wanted to set the scene with this um, statement. Many artists create work that intersects with political activism and social justice causes. Throughout history, art has been used as an accessible tool for communication, raising awareness about social issues and effective, affecting, I'm sorry, positive change. This year was a year of many major shifts that took place in our society, including COVID-19, the stance against police brutality, and even the presidential election results. And so my question is, how have you lent your artistic voice during this time? I'll go first. <laughs> so I've spoke, I've talked about um, the recitals that I've been curating um, with Kappa. And um, I think that outside of my actual performing, I'm more of a behind the scenes kind of person. I like to, um, I like to be a part of the, the major project for social change or justice. So um, I've been working with Kappa. Um, I will be the project manager, one of the project managers for their um, upcoming a series entitled uh, Generations Music in the Black Family. But aside from that, in um, the educational sector, I really do enjoy helping my students learn how to organize. That's become something that um, really does bring me great joy to really assist them because they, aside from myself being the voice of, you know, millennials, their generation went Z and they, they're, you know, the younger generation. And it's, and it's really exciting for me to help them um, learn how to express themselves through their art. Um, I'm currently one of the advisors for the Black Student Union. That is something that I've been working with for the past two years. I was the sitting advisor um, when the union had, um, was first uh, thought of, I suppose, at its inception. I was there through the entire process teaching the kids how to um, 
organize themselves, how to, you know, advocate for what it is that that the um, student body needed, the Black students that that attend um, Baltimore School for the Arts. So um, I also uh, participated in, so I, you know, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I really did participate in some of the marches that happened in uh, Baltimore when um, George Floyd was murdered. And those, uh, mar one of the biggest marches that happened was organized by my students. So that, that really gave me a lot of joy to see them putting the tools that I gave them and the things that we talked about in school, you know, you know, on the pavement. So I could really into grassroots work. That's kind of my, my thing. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm really inspired to hear that you have already started the process of sharing that information and providing youth the platform to share their voices and you know, stand up for what they believe in. So that is um, really, really um, great for me to hear and really refreshing as well. So thank you, Ayana, for all of your continued work. Erin, would you like to share um, on this question from a business aspect? Absolutely. Um, so from the business aspect, as it pertains to me, um, when the pandemic first hit, there was um, there was a, 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 a huge devastation um, economically. So the stimulus was given um, under the CARES Act. So uh, the CARES Act, CARES Act was a $2 trillion um, relief act that provided funding for uh, large corporations, stimulus, which we know of the $1,200, um, airlines, a whole bunch of people, but uh, there was a, a large portion of that went directly to businesses. A lot of people, primarily in the African American community, weren't aware of this billions and billions of dollars that was available to them. Um, so once again, being home, I was able to do research on that, that I wouldn't have probably been able to do if I was in the office and learn how to do those uh, those loans that turn into conditional grants. So um, when that hit, uh, I started doing uh, PPP loans for small business owners, uh, primarily African Americans, um, and those loans turned into conditional grants. So whatever your income was for 2019, you're able to receive 2.5 uh, 2.5 times your monthly revenues. Um, so I did about 10 or 11 PPP loans for African American uh, small businesses, um, and on the grant on the on the um, on the loan side, first it turns into a loan, and now. Those funds have been used. I'm now doing the grant aspect of it, where you submit all your documentation to uh, submit for the grant aspect of it. Um, so just trying to put money back into um, into the Black community. Uh, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that um, African Americans we contribute 1.2 trillion dollars annually to the U.S. retail economy, but only account for 13 percent of the U.S. population. So putting dollars back into our hands is very important. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Erin. And I really appreciate the work that you have been doing for our Black communities from an economic standpoint. I am so happy to hear it made my heart glad that, you know, some of the loans that you were talking about, you were able to make them um, grant opportunities versus the loan. Um, they, were all, some, they were all grants. They're, they're called loans, but if you have your documentation in order, um, primarily your, your Schedule C showing your income, you can apply for conditional grants. So all of them have been um, submitted for grants. Well, that is excellent to hear. Um, and I'm sure such a blessing to those who've been able to benefit from the community. So again, just thank you. And thank you for your focus on pouring back into our um, communities um, from a financial aspect. It's very important. Um, and we all know that we can't survive without money. So thank you for that. Um, how about Jemaya, would you like to share your perspective on how you've been able to raise your voice um, against some of the things that have been going on during the year? <laughs> um, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, with, with COVID, of course, kind of everything was so abrupt, honestly. It's not like, well, for me, let me say that, because everybody says, oh, it's been talked about for you know, a couple months now and then, but it really like, it really hit the fan when, you know, when your boss comes in and you're sitting at your desk and they just come to you and they're like, hey, you gotta go home. And it's like, it's a shock because it's like, okay, 
I got to go home, but this bill is due today. So what you mean? I'm going home. So it was kind of a shock for me because um, I do artistry, but I also work a regular job because at the end of the day, you need a backup plan and I try to do both. Um, So not having that job and being laid off for the first time in my life, I was actually very scared and confused because I, I didn't know what to do, honestly. So with the whole, you know, unemployment thing where, you know, they put the, you know, $600 on top of, you know, the regular unemployment, it definitely helped, which kind of brings me back to what I said, opportunity definitely came up in the face of adversity because I was able to acquire a new home, a new apartment for myself, which I was never able to do before then. So I do feel like with COVID stepping in and doing what it did, (laughs) it definitely um, gave me a place um, of my own to where I could actually be very creative. I was never really able to be super creative in the places that I was in before. So COVID gave me the opportunity to do that um, with me having my own place as it In regards to the Black Lives Matter and all of that stuff, I didn't really participate in any of those things. I hate to say that because I am a Black female and I should be able to, I should have taken part, but honestly, it was a scary time and I don't, I don't like to dabble in things that I'm not really educated in. Um, So I I definitely uh, feel like me going out there and, and, protesting for something that I'm not truly knowledgeable knowledgeable about would have put me in a situation where I would have to speak up for myself and I would not know what to say. So I honestly kind of just prayed <laughs> in, in the safety of my own home and definitely was sending love and, and, and light towards the people who are actually out there fighting for their lives and fighting for us, the people that did know. So I definitely commend those that were out there doing that. Well, I really appreciate your response, Jemiah. I think um, a lot of people have those same shared feelings. While you have those out on the forefront, you also have those who are maybe a little bit more reserved, but also Mm -hmm. advocacy in their way, whether it's on their social media page and they're resharing or they're reposting um, something that is in solidarity with the movement or they're sending up prayers or whatever it is that they do um, just to show their respects. Um, I think that every little bit counts. So I really do appreciate your response and your honesty and your perspective regarding this. Um, And before I ask Dean and Kylan, I just want to re-ask the question just so you all um, have it fresh on your brains. And the question is, how have you lent your artistic voice during this time? Um, So I'll say that I haven't really been able to use my art use my voice in an artistic way to help this situation whatever but from another standpoint I'm I'm in the fraternity Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and one of the things that we have is called a voteless people is a hopeless people and what we do is and so that basically means you know just like just trying to get people to vote and talking about this pat like this this election how important it was and how many people were not registered to vote or who were registered but just never voted at all or people who just aren't really educating themselves or who aren't knowledgeable about really about really what's happening so my my chapter we really focused on getting people like more people registered in this area I mean, well, we're in the in the Montgomery County uh, chapter. I mean, in the in the Montgomery County area, that's where we really focused. But also, since I do live in Prince George's, I you know reached out to people that I knew were not registered at all, and um, you know just trying to do my part. Thank you so much, Dean. I really appreciate um, you being a person who was out there getting people registered and signed up to vote. Um, As you said, this was definitely an important election for us um, during such a difficult year. So thank you for your work on that. I really appreciate it. And lastly, Kylan, would you like to address this question as well? 
Yeah, um, I like to think that for the most part, I've always been kind of politically and socially aware and involved. I actually started in theater because I was a part of this device theater group, which was creating plays for social change. And so it's been something since I was like 11 or 12 years old that I've always been a part of. Um, but this year in particular, it was interesting being on furlough um, when all of the civil unrest happened um, because the company that I worked for um, had furloughed 98%, 99% of the black employees. So when it came time to having a black voice, they actually came to us. And so we're furloughed and, and they try to frame it like it wasn't working, but we came, they asked us and we kind of pushed for us to have a kind of a statement of solidarity, a statement to say like what's happening, which prompted a lot of different conversations in regards to how that company specifically has kind of upheld white supremacy. And so there were a lot of conversations in regards to like the mission statement for that organization is engaging the widest and the most diverse audiences possible. And then we, we kind of, put that question back to them and like, have we been doing that? Have we been doing that with the art that we have on stage? Have we been doing that with the creatives that we've been hiring? Have we been doing that with the tech staff that we have backstage? Have we been doing that with their admin team? So I think for me specifically, because I do have uh, the opportunity to work with a lot of predominantly white organizations, um, even till today, uh, something that I will continue to do in meetings is kind of push that, like, we're not gonna stop having those conversations about, um, racism we're not going to stop having those conversations about why people from marginalized communities specifically black people are not allowed in certain spaces specifically when it deals with black entertainment and the arts so it's something that i continue to push um and it shows up in different ways whether that's working with an organization going back and doing device theater around um the civil unrest that happened or whether it's um working with different companies as they begin to build their fellowship and internship program really going like okay now who are you hiring and why and what is your um what does your applicants look like and what schools are we looking towards? Um, I will share like there was a recruiter for the company that I'm working with who did not know what HBCUs meant. So they never did, so they never like took applications from there. And so when you hear that you don't know what HBCUs are and you're a recruiter for a really big organization, it's like, wait, what? So like those are some of the things that I have to like kind of with a team of people, I would say like a lot of colleagues who have been doing this prior to me who are really like, okay, let's look at our applicants and like let's begin to really be more specific at what schools we're looking at. So that's one way in which I kind of like use my art and my art administrative skills and duties to kind of help with that conversation and dialogue. Wow. Thank you so much, Kylan. Um, I really appreciate your response and, and again, the work that you have been doing to educate those who um, are just misinformed or misguided in some ways. And I really appreciate you being on the forefront of representing us in, a, in, a, in the way that we should be. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I do have one more question regarding this um, portion of the panel. And it reads, what are you hoping for from the new presidential administration regarding their support of the arts? Um, I can speak on the business side. Uh, uh, so from the business side, I, I really hope while this, uh, the administration, uh, Biden's putting together a great team um, in terms of cabinet members, a lot of the same players that uh, Obama had in the Obama administration, um, I really hope that they, you know, actually put policy over politics. Um, he's spoken a lot of great points in his campaign about um, things that he wants to change. But one of the big things that I'm looking at is student loan debt. Um, they they uh, halted student loan debt. Um, the current administration um, halted student loan debt until the end of January. It's now January 31st, but Biden has the, uh, the opportunity to abolish student loan debt, which is currently at $1.6 trillion. Um, and they gave out $2 trillion to large corporations, businesses. Um, so it's really, it's, it's really political. You know, another thing, they're getting ready to release this next round of stimulus, and they're still fighting to see whether or not they're going to give um, $1,200 or $600 to individuals when large corporations received millions and millions of dollars. So um, there's a reason for that. There's a lot of money to go around, but there's a lot of politics that go uh, go with it. So just hoping they put the policy over politics. Wow. Well, I am standing in solidarity with all of those who are looking to abolish student loan debt. Um, thank you so much, Erin, for your yeah. response and just educating us um, a bit on the business aspect of what you're hoping for. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, would anyone else like to share or add from an artistic standpoint? Dean, please share. Yeah, 
I'll say, um, so when I was in college, for one semester, I was a music education major. Then I switched it right back to into piano performance. But because I have two parents who are now retired, who were who were in the education system, my mom was a principal, and my dad just um, finished being a music teacher. I I have seen I've been in the school systems where these the, these students have old robes, they have old instruments that. Uh, that, that that are broken and I, I i would hope that he puts his administration finds a way to put more money in the arts because you know it, it is therapy you know a lot of people i feel like there should be a lot more people majoring in music therapy when they get into college because it definitely does help and it's it's a different part of your brain that you have to reach and it does take a certain type of person to to, to really hack into that talent. I really appreciate your response, Dean. And I agree that the arts, um, not even specifically music, the arts in general can be a very therapeutic outlet for so many people who have so many different needs and, and ailments that can use those tools to really um, find them as a point of healing. Um, and also just to help them kind of just recenter themselves and refocus and let out some of the energy, whether it's trauma, whether it's, you know, excitement, it, it allows them to do that. So I absolutely agree with you. And I would love to see also more funding go into the schools in support of the arts for our youth. Um, would anyone else like to address the question, Ayana? Okay, so this might be a controversial opinion, but I don't personally believe that it is the administration's um, job to save, you know, our communities. I believe that it is our responsibility mostly to save our communities, whether it be music, performance, you know, the Black community, all of those things. I mean, of course, you're always going to need advocates and you're always going to need people who are going to rally behind you and really be allies for whatever it is that your particular community wants to um, you know, bring to the forefront. But I really seriously believe in grassroots work. So my personal hope is that you know, the Black community really begins to value the importance of the arts in our own communities. And I really, I really hope that we begin to hold politicians and hold administrators accountable for the things that they have promised our communities and the things that they have said they're going to, you know, give to our communities. Because of course, politicians are going to say whatever it is that will get your particular community to rally behind you. But if no one is holding them accountable, if no one is hitting the pavement, hitting the streets, really like going and getting, um, you know, having their voice be heard, like what we're doing now, um, so many different artists have moved into this virtual setting and began holding conversations and began like creating alliances that advocate for what it is that we need within our own respective art form. We need more of those types of groups to be established so that policyholders, policymakers can see that our art form is just as important as the STEM field. Our art form is equally as important as, you know, literature and art, I mean, literature and history and um, chemistry and all of those things that we, that we have to, that our children have to learn in public school education. So, that's my, just my little tidbit. I did vote, but I'm just saying. Ayan, I want to ask you a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, you said in the beginning, you said that we we should be more responsible, and you also said that the politicians should be responsible. Um, which one? No, you... I said that we should we we hold a responsibility to our own communities, and it's up to us to hold those policymakers, those administrators the superintendent, the mayors of your cities, uh, you know, your councilmen, you, it's our responsibility to hold them accountable when they make these promises 
to our community because they want our votes. So we also need to, once they're in office, hold them accountable. You what, are your, what are your thoughts on so, lower socioeconomic areas that aren't even aware of the, um, the opportunities afforded to them and their, and their council members and congressmen and things like that? I'd say that's a direct, that's directly. Um, Absolutely. So how many people have come out of those communities who have left those communities and abandoned their communities? It's their responsibility. It's our responsibility. We come from these communities. Why do we leave them? You know, once we've gotten to our degrees, we've gotten to whatever it is, whatever, you know, social standard for our lives and we never go back and we never advocate on behalf of those who don't have a voice for themselves. It still lies within us because they're like the schools that I work for, the school district that I work for, Baltimore City Public School, is one of the largest school districts in the state of Maryland. But it's completely under some schools are so underfunded, you know, they're getting shut down every single, every single school year. And it's partially because we have people from the community who, of course, they don't know that they need to advocate for themselves, but we have people like myself and my coworkers and other local Baltimoreans who need to advocate for those schools and we need to advocate for our school districts and our kids. I agree. I, I, I was gonna say, but like that also goes into- Am I stirring the pot? <laughs> no, 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 no. You are definitely not. But I was gonna say that that definitely hits the big picture right now to me, how, we need to educate the people in our communities to vote for these exactly. local legislators and these like i mean because i feel like all we learn in general school to me it just seems like hey vote for the president and vote for the vice president or, what, or just whatever like democrat republican that's what we're taught we're not taught to 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 vote for your local school, um, your local school yeah, district, absolutely. your mayor, you know, so I feel like a part of what you said, we have to also come out and, and talk to our brothers and sisters and say, yo, bro, sis, please educate yourself on this person because these, I mean, because whether you like it or not, these are the people who are your biggest advocates absolutely. in your community. Yeah. We just have so many organizations that, you know, come out and tell these communities, yeah, go and vote, but that's it. There are people within our community who have power, who, who are affluent, who have education. It's their responsibility to go back to those areas that are not, you know, equitable and share their knowledge and share what it is that, that needs to happen so that, you know, children are able to, you know, receive the same kind of, or the same kind of responsibilities as every other kid in, um, well, for me personally, from Maryland. And I'm not even from Maryland and I advocate for my kids all the time. And kids who don't even go to Baltimore School for the Arts, because to be honest, it really is one of the most affluent uh, schools in the district. But even within, even within my school, I'm advocating for kids who, who, who don't even have like equitable opportunity to audition for the school. I'm advocating for us to do runouts at elementary schools and middle schools that are in low income areas so that they can see what it is that they can be. If it wasn't for us, me, my coworkers, though, you know, people going to administrators and saying, this is what we need to do, they would never think of it because it's not really their responsibility in their heads. I don't say that to be disrespectful, but that's kind of how it comes off. Well, I appreciate everyone's response. Um, I really also enjoyed the fruitful conversation that we were able to just exchange with one another. I think that that's why it's so important that we have this space, that we as the uprising generation can share um, our thoughts and our perspectives about many different things and also educate each other um, and support why we feel this or why we feel that. Um, so again, I just appreciate um, that healthy conversation that we just had. Um, so thank you all. And that being said, I'm just now going to transition into our next portion, which is our also our final um, 
portion of the panel, which really focuses on next steps and also focusing on what are the needs from some of our seasoned professionals in our various fields. Um, and so the first question is, going forward, how can seasoned artists lend a helping hand to emerging artists? Easy, mentor. Literally, <laughs> mentor. I mean, I feel like, you know, if, if they do that and show and actually guide them on how to maneuver on their journey, it could be a little bit easier for them instead of them trying to have to figure it out. And then it takes even longer. And then, you know, it's just, then it becomes a little bit of a mess and then they recover and then it just keeps going back and forth. But the long and short of it, just to mentor, I feel, I feel like mentorship is the best tool for the younger uh, generation that the older generation, I would say, uh, should do, you know? I totally agree. Um, that's what I was gonna say, mentorship. Um, a lot of the opportunities, a lot of the um, things that I've been able to accomplish in, in my career have been large in part to my mentors putting me in a position or putting me in the direction to do it. And so I'd say in terms of lending a helping hand, I'm now transitioning into a, a, a part of my career where it's my turn to extend a hand back down. So we, you know, as as um, you know, as individuals, we continue to extend the hand back down and pulling people up. We can all succeed. I completely agree. I think mentorship is so important, and um, similar to the conversation that we were previously having, it's it's important to pay it forward. Um, and someone has paid it for it for all of us to be where we are. I um, in some aspect of our lives, whether it was a teacher, a parent. Um, a mentor of whatever sort and mentorship is very important. Um, Kylan, um, would you also like to add to this question? Yeah, I definitely agree with mentorship and I think allowing people into the room um, and not just allowing them into the room, but a seat at the table and then having them like express their voice at the table is always helpful. Um, I also think that um, just thinking about like, even like from the, the conversation you all had uh, prior to this one is like a lot of stuff is systemic. And so when talking about the arts and providing access is a lot of it is having to rethink how do we dismantle the systemic systems that keeps people of color, specifically black people from engaging with the arts and whether that's performing, whether that's working with them or even just coming to a show. And so how do we look into that? Um, and I know that there's a letter going around, I'm not quite sure if everyone saw it, but it's a letter going around signed by people that's asking for Biden and for Harris to kind of Put together a secretary of arts and, arts and culture and like many different people are like signing it and saying like there needs to be a need for someone to have a cabinet level position there that's really looking over arts and culture um i'm not quite sure if they're going to do it but if they do do it i think that they need to have someone who is a person of color specifically someone who is black and someone who is from a black organization because i think that is one way that you move the conversation forward and move arts forward is having people who have been marginalized a chance to not only sit at the table but build the table um, so that's what I'm hoping for is like mentorship, but also for people of color, especially black people to be allowed to start building what this can look like in the future. I absolutely agree. And I would hope that that is something that would be able to come into fruition is that, like you said, more people of color coming into leadership roles, um, just to be able to push forward some of the needs of our community um, that have just really been going unmet for so long. So I really appreciate your response. Ayana, would you like to add to that? Sure. So um, aside from like mentorship, which I think the Black opera community is really, um, I guess, trying to uh, center around now more than in years prior, I think that there needs to be like a prioritization of historically black colleges and universities, because from I, I'm like you know both of my degrees are from HBCU, so I'm gonna advocate for HBCUs to the day that I die, you know. But there there's just a lack of um, like support from the classical community with HBCUs, and I will say that I'm very thankful for Kappa because Kappa started a masterclass series where they invite 
classical singers to different HBCUs and they give master classes. If it had not been for Kappa, then I would have never met some of the opera singers that I know today. I would have never been introduced to like real time advice, you know, in this career field. And it's partially because a lot of HBCUs just don't have the funding to bring the artist. So if black classical artists were to prioritize the schools that don't have the funding to really, you know, typically afford the master classes, I think you would see like, an, you would definitely see an influx of black classical singers. You would definitely see like, um, you know, a, a, I guess, more uh, students coming out of the programs who can actually access, you know, young artist programs because they have the tools that they need to succeed in the in the art form. Because as quiet as it's kept, and I guess it's not really that quietly kept, classical music is expensive. You know, from paying for voice lessons to paying for vocal coachings to paying for auditions to paying for uh, accompanist fees to pay for everything. It's an extensive career to, you know, embark on. And if more classical singers were to step out and be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give you how to get there. And I'm going to come to your school, even though your school doesn't have the fun to really afford my fee and, you know, share that I really feel like that would make a big difference. So shout out to Kappa for starting the Masterclass series. Yes, a big, huge shout out to Kappa. Thank you for all that you have been offering to our youth, um, as well as our even our seasoned professionals. So, and also thank you, Ayana, for your response. I really appreciate it. And now I'm going to move into our final question. I know we've been on for some time now, and I, I really enjoyed hearing all of you all's perspectives and responses. Um, and so I will end with this. How will you ground yourself using your art form in the next year? Um, oh, go. oh, go ahead. Who is go that, ahead. Aaron? Aaron, go ahead. No, no, you please. Go ahead. Okay. Right. Well, I, I want to say that through this pandemic, I feel blessed that my art has kept me grounded in moments where I didn't know if I was going to have a job or know, you know, my parents, both my parents contracted COVID and my sister and my god sister and a, lot of, a couple of my family members. So in those moments where I just did not know what the status of even my parents' lives was going to look like art and music and being able to sing has really kept me grounded and um like living up to the promises that i've been you know i guess gifted has really kept me grounded so i i, I pray that i keep this you know humble spirit going forward into the next year and always trying to look the you know the glass half full and keep the positivity, but yeah. Well, I'm happy to hear that, Ayana, um, and I'm so sorry to hear about all the challenges and adversities that you've been faced with um, personally. Yeah. So I'm glad that you've been looking to your creative um, forms for some energy um, and positivity, so thank you. Dean, would you like to share? Can you repeat the question one more time? Yes. So the question just asked, how will you ground yourself using your art form next year? How will I ground myself? Um, just being consistent, I would say. Um, consist consistency is would be the best thing for me. And I would presume that it would be the best thing for everyone. Just keep your heads up. Um, just keep just keeping our heads up, but staying optimistic. Everything, knowing that there is there is a light at the end of the tunnel, I would say, and just keeping the faith. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm you know a Christian, so I I I the faith 
this whole time, just knowing that, you know, for me, God had my back. He did this um, for a reason. He, he did it for me just to sit me down and to re-evaluate everything that I needed to do for myself. Um, so yeah, just being consistent. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Dean. I really appreciate your, your response. Um, so thank you. Um, Aaron, how about you? Um, I say the, the way that I'm going this upcoming year is to not put limits on my abilities. Um, with the business, as I said, I originally uh, planned to just do it in the DMV area to where now it's, it's, it's global. Um, and so I've been faced with a lot of questions in terms of the business that I never thought about and have even shied away from in terms of uh, the direction I go in. One of which I this weekend was, this past weekend was, do I want to be registered as a C Corp or an S Corp? And that would really determine long-term um, whether I'd have shareholders, how, how other people can invest in my business and these have been stuff. This has been something that, like I said, I'd never thought of. I was just going to invite uh, some friends and hopefully grow from people telling each other, whereas now um, there's been no no limit to to the um, to the size of the business. So continuing never to doubt myself, and as well, uh, also you know keeping God first. You know, and His Word says, uh, "Man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps." So uh, allowing allowing Him to direct my steps and and go as far as I can. Amen. I really appreciate your response, Aaron, and. I hope that we all can take on that perspective of not putting limitations on ourselves, but we just continue to push and, you know, just lean, um, lean on to whomever you believe in. Um, for some of us, that is God and just, you know, continue to just pr press forward in the midst of it all. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you, amen. And lastly, Kylan, would you like to share? Yeah, I think for me, just staying grounded means I think I said, like I said earlier, like prior to COVID, like I was just working to like make just to like get up the next day and go upon my schedule. But I think now making sure that I'm always close to my artistic um, things that I do, whether that's writing, whether that's um, directing, whether that's acting and making sure that I'm close to it and making sure that it's something that I am consistently working on that I'm consistently going to professional developments about that I'm consistently working on my craft just for me and then if I can find a way to make that profitable then do, doing that but making sure that I'm not so wrapped up in just like paying bills that I forget the reason why I chose to go into the artistic life in the first place so for me it's just continuing to remember why I chose this and then every day getting up and remembering that why that's so important. Remembering your why is very important. And I just want to say thank you to you all for just being open, being transparent during this panel. Again, I have truly just enjoyed listening to everything you all have shared and said during this time. Um, so again, congratulations to you all and shout out to you for just being a part of this journey with us. Um, I also want to say thank you to Kappa for allowing us this space as young artists and emerging artists and young people and our different perspectives um, to just have a safe space to share how we feel and learn from each other and hear each other out. So thank you. Um, and now I believe actually before we go to the outro video, I would um, like for each panelist to share where they're from. If you would like to share your contact information as far as your social media handle, you can do that as well. Um, so I will first start with Kylan. Uh, yes, again, my name is Kylan. I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, I can be found on Instagram and Twitter at Kylan Justin. And then if you're new to like Clubhouse, I can be find, found at just Kylan. Thank you so much, Kylan. Ayana? All right. Um, again, my name is Ayana Freelon, and I am originally from Grenada, Mississippi, and I am currently based in Baltimore, Maryland. If you like to follow me on Instagram, you can. It's underscore Ayana Freeman or friend me on Facebook. Also, my first and my last name, very simple. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ayana. And Dean? Hey, everyone. I am Dean Johnson on Instagram. You can follow me at I am Dean Johnson. And on Facebook, just a regular name, Dean Johnson. Thank you so much, Dean. And lastly, Aaron. 
Uh, I'm Aaron Richards. I'm from Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Uh, if you'd like to know more about stocks and option investing, you can follow me at ITF underscore investments. Uh, that's ITF underscore investments and everything's free. All right. Thank you all again so much for sharing your perspectives and your insight during this time. I also want to say thank you to our viewers who tuned into tonight's panel. Um, we appreciate you for watching us just have this live conversation. Um, you can follow us, I believe, on at 4Kappa is the Instagram name. Um, and Kappa can be found also on YouTube as well as Facebook. Again, this conversation was just a time for us to reflect on our different experiences and perspectives from this difficult and challenging year. Um, our next panel is scheduled for Tuesday, March 2nd. Um, so we will be into the third month of the new year. Uh, we hope to see you there. We'll be at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern, and it will more than likely be live streamed again as well. So thank you all again. Um, and now I will turn it over to Jay our tech person for our outro video. I would like to say thank you to our moderator, the panelist, executive director and chairperson for providing such a rich and open dialogue. The panelists have truly provoked great thought and hopefully further conversation. I'd like to also offer a special thanks to all of our viewers for sharing in this moment. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.